how much, if at all, the Supreme Court should respect its prior decisions. Um, you'll hear bandied about a Latin phrase, stare decisis, which stands for let the decision stands. It's a shorthand reference to the Supreme Court's historic practice of respecting prior decisions. Uh, there's probably no area of law right now that is more, um, I suppose, the target of uh, efforts to overrule precedent than the areas of privacy and reproductive rights. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Jonathan Seaman Hot Buttons Cool Conversation Series. My name is Mark Sokol. I'm the president and CEO of JCC Greater Boston. This series invites distinguished public figures to engage in conversation on controversial and sometimes difficult subjects. Our panelists are led by an expert moderator through respectful and thought-provoking discussions on issues of concern to the Jewish community and well beyond. Our hallmark is always civil dialogue and conversation, both when the panelists agree and even more importantly, when they don't. Jonathan Seyman fostered and modeled this behavior his entire life and career. We are thrilled to partner as always with the great team at WGBH with tonight's program entitled An Unprecedented Court. Tonight, we will examine the nation's top court and its power to determine the direction of a host of hot button issues. With the court's actions to leave a controversial abortion law in place last fall, we look to what the public should expect in laws on privacy and reproductive rights as well. As the court signals its willingness to reconsider precedents, we will look at what other laws may be on the docket, all while the nation anticipates confirmation for Supreme Court nominee Ketanji Brown Jackson. We have an incredible panel this evening for you. First, Gary Lawson is a professor at Boston University. Gary has authored eight editions of a textbook on administrative law and co-authored a textbook on constitutional law. He is a founder member of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies and is on the editorial advisory board of the Heritage Guide for, to the Constitution. He twice clerked for Justice Antonin Scalia. Gary, welcome, and we are thrilled to have you. Melissa Murray is a law professor at New York University Law School. She teaches constitutional, family, and criminal law and reproductive rights and justice. Previously, she taught at the University of California, Berkeley, and served as interim dean of the law school there. Melissa is also a legal analyst for MSNBC and co-host of Strict Scrutiny, a podcast about the Supreme Court. She clerked for Justice Sonia Sotomayor. And Jed Sugerman is a professor at Fordham Law School and in full disclosure, a member of Temple Beth Zion in Brookline, as am I. This will have no bearing on the outcome of tonight's program. He is also the author of The People's Courts, which traces the rise of judicial elections, judicial review, and the influence of money and parties in American courts. He is currently working on two books on the history of executive power and prosecution in America. To lead us this evening, we are so fortunate to have Michael Gerhardt moderating tonight's panel. Michael was gracious enough to step in due to a very late programming change. And for that, Michael, we are very grateful. Michael is a constitutional law professor at University of North Carolina. His teaching focuses on constitutional conflicts between presidents and Congress. He's the author of seven books, including his latest book, Lincoln's Mentors. He has testified more than 20 times before Congress. Gary, Melissa, Jed, and Michael, we are thrilled to have all of you with us this evening. Thank you for being here. As we begin our program, we'd also like to thank our generous donors. Without your financial support, we would not be able to produce tonight's program and the almost 30 other programs we have produced over the last decade. We appreciate your commitment to fulfilling the mission of both the Jonathan Seyman Hot Buttons Cool Conversation Series and our JCC. It is now my pleasure and honor to turn our program this evening over to our moderator, moderator, Michael Gerhardt. Michael, all yours. Thank you very much. I appreciate the chance to join all of you. Uh, it's an honor to be part of the program. And I just wanna offer a few sort of initial uh, 
thoughts um, before we sort of start rounds of questioning with our terrific uh, panelists. Um, I should also note that I'm coming to you from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and I think I'm the only event in town tonight that doesn't relate to basketball. Um, and so I, it's a daring thing I'm trying, but I'm happy to do it. Um, much of our, I appreciate Mark sort of reminding us what the scope of our program is tonight. We're gonna to cover a lot of major questions. Some of the biggest questions you can ever cover. Um, perhaps the central one of which is the question about how much, if at all, the Supreme Court should respect its prior decisions. Um, you'll hear bandied about a Latin phrase, stare decisis, which stands for let the decision stands. It's a shorthand reference to the Supreme Court's historic practice of respecting prior decisions. Uh, there's probably no area of law right now that is more, um, I suppose, the target of um, uh, efforts to overrule precedent than the areas of privacy and reproductive rights. So uh, there's a lot going on in that area, that field, um, and we're gonna talk about a lot of it. And last but not least, I want to set the stage a little bit for our discussion. After all, we are meeting tonight, uh, not long after uh, a virtually week long confirmation hearing was held for President Biden's nomination of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson to the US Supreme Court. Uh, the Judiciary Committee will consider the nomination beginning of next week, and the full Senate will likely vote shortly thereafter. For anyone that has seen the hearings or heard about the hearings, they are important and historic for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is, as we know, uh, that the nominee, Judge Jackson, is the first African-American woman to be nominated to the court, and if confirmed, she'll be the first African-American woman, African woman to sit on the US Supreme Court. Um, there's even more historic um, uh, elements to her nomination and to her appointment. Again, we'll talk about those. But one of them I want to single out right now. Um, and that is, if you did watch or read about the hearings, um, you'll likely have a number of thoughts, perhaps criticisms about them. And a number of people are very critical of, uh, about Supreme Court confirmation hearings, thinking they don't tell us much at all. Um, they're just, as Justice Kagan once said, a kabuki dance. Um, I think that's really unfair to kabuki dances because I think there is a purpose, um, both to the hearings um, and, of course, to such dancing. But, uh, and I think that purpose is, in part, um, to get to know the nominee. It's also a way, I think, for us to get to know the Senate and the Senate Judiciary Committee. And it's also an opportunity, a rare opportunity, to um, perhaps figure out if uh, any degree of sort of, let's call it accountability for the person that's named. Just by way of background, um, confirmation hearings are often uh, contentious. They're particularly contentious when the nomination breaks the glass ceiling. The very first Supreme Court confirmation hearing was in fact held for a Bostonian, uh, Justice Louis Brandeis. Uh, Brandeis didn't testify, but his nomination was fought over for six months in public with six presidents of the ABA and a former president of the USA testifying against him. And the hearings were largely laced with anti-Semitism. If we fast forward to the 1960s, that's the time when Justice Thurgood Marshall is nominated to the Supreme Court. And he is ultimately confirmed just like Justice Brandeis, but faces a number of belittling and demeaning questions from a number of, um, for lack of a better word, racist senators. Um, and then as we come more closely to the present, um, Justice Sotomayor um, was the first Hispanic woman, of course, to be nominated to the court. And her hearings too were filled sometimes with questions about her competence. Um, Judge Jackson had to face a number of questions, not just about her competence, but, um, but uh, some that were, I think, quite demeaning. Uh, and revealing perhaps. Um, and that is going to be close to a good place to start. Um, I'm gonna to get to a question about what our panelists thought of the hearings right after they discuss just really quite briefly um, what they consider this unprecedented court to be. You know, from the title of our program, 
Um, is it unprecedented? If so, how is it unprecedented? And I'll start with our um, panelist, Melissa. Thanks for that introduction, Michael, and thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. And thank you for, to the JCC for sponsoring this talk and GBH for broadcasting it so widely. Um, is this an unprecedented court? Um, I don't think it is. Uh, I think the Supreme Court has historically been as rib rocked conservative as this particular court is, but I don't think we've seen a court quite like this in our lifetime. So to that extent, um, if we're thinking only about our own frame of reference, then perhaps this is actually unprecedented. We have a court that is a solid six to three conservative super majority. And I think it is not unfair for the public to take from that the impression that the personnel of the court actually matters for what the court does in terms of substantive outcomes. And that impression may suggest that law is perhaps less important than who is deciding what the law is. And I think you could definitely come away from the court, at least as it's con currently constituted with that view. And we've had other times where many Americans have had that view of the court. I mean, the Warren court is the same dynamic, just in the opposite direction. Um, but I think what is distinctive about this particular court is that I don't know that we've seen this kind of acceleration, um, disregard for settled precedent and a desire to withdraw rights that have been previously recognized and have been recognized for some time. And so to that extent, the willingness to not only dismantle years of precedent, but to do so in a way that retracts and withdraws existing rights does seem to me at least to be somewhat unprecedented, even though we have had controversial courts before, we have had courts with um, a particular ideological skew before, I don't think we have seen anything quite like this. Okay, thank you, Melissa. I, I'm going to ask Jed next, and then we'll follow with Gary. But uh, Jed, what's your view on this? Yeah, I, I'll pick up where Melissa left off. Uh, I, I agree with Melissa that, that there it, the, the court, the Supreme Court has been to, to the right of center for more or less 200 years of the country's 233 his, years of history. Um, the Warren Court is, and, and part of the Bergen, Burger Court, meaning like the mid 1950s to the early 1970s was really the only time the court was to the left of center. But so, um, so this is that, I totally agree that it's not unprecedented in that way. What is unprecedented is uh, presidents winning elections without winning the popular vote, and then nominating judges to the court that don't reflect national majorities, right? And so, so even though Bush wins the second election, but the first election was, was without winning a majority, and so two of his justices are on the court, Alito and Roberts. And then um, the three other justices from Trump, uh, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett, um, reflects what is a, what I would say is unprecedented, that usually when the Supreme Court tacks a little to the left or tacks a little bit to the right, it reflects a series of national elections where issues are teed up, resolved, and then there's a hangover effect of those elections. And this is more counter-majoritarian, even if the court is supposed to be counter-majoritarian sometimes, this is unprecedentedly so, right? So that's one way. And I think we'll talk about these two other topics. And uh, we'll talk about stare decisis, but I think there's another way that the court is uh, unprecedented. So stare decisis means standing by the decisions, uh, and it's it's Latin, as Michael mentioned. Um, but there's also I might think of this as un, the unprecedentedness relates to what you might call stare institutio, mm -hmm. or stare administratio, or stare traditio, like undoing all those things. We've had a New Deal administrative state since, since the 1930s. But since the progressive era, we've had an approach to social problems with more executive power um, in ways that I think I'm probably split. In some ways, I'm sure I agree with Melissa. In some ways, I actually agree with, with Gary. We'll, we'll tease that out. But I want to frame it as um, the thing that's not on the public's radar right now is that there is a core, there's a decision no one's heard of. And uh, except, you know, Melissa talks about it on, on her podcast, but I, I want to put it on people's radar here. It's called West Virginia versus EPA. And it's not going to change everything by itself, but it could be the first decision that, tr that dramatically undoes 
the precedent, not of court decisions, but the precedent of federal administrative regulation in what could wind up being a dramatic reversal of, of the kind of government and administration that we've been used to as a set of, of institutional precedents. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Jed. I, your comments sort of raised for me an image that William Rehnquist, once a, an associate justice, later chief justice of the Supreme Court, used to use uh, in explaining to his law clerks what his function was. Um, and he call, thought of himself as a conservative trying to yank the ship, which you just described as the ship had gone way too far left. Rehnquist said the job, our job is to yank it so it's upright. But I wonder as we move to Gary, whether that is still the view of conservatives, um, just having it upright or um, I'm, one thing I'm really kind of curious about is whether maybe the, the objective should be sinking that ship rather than um, just putting it upright. Uh, but Gary, tell us about the unprecedented court as you see it, and then you can uh, respond to whatever I've just said as well. All right, let, let me just absolutely thank JCC Greater Boston for sponsoring that. Th these kinds of conversations are more important than I can possibly express. There's just no way to, to communicate how important this sort of thing is. Let me just open with three very quick observations and then we'll, we'll, we'll get into the, the, the discussion. Two observations about the current term and one observation about the court more generally. Uh, I've been in COVID quarantine for a week. So I haven't had a lot to do. So I sat down and I've read the oral arguments for most of the cases this term, something I would not normally have, have chosen as a pastime. A couple of observations about them. Now, observation number one, this is a pretty tepid term overall. I mean, this, this, this does not leap out as a term full of enormous blockbuster after blockbuster cases. There are a couple of cases that we'll, we'll talk about that are, that are major, but, but overall, does this have the feel of a Supreme Court term where major changes in jurisprudence are lurking? It just, it, it just doesn't have that, that feel. Uh, second observation about the current term, there is a tiny number of cases, maybe two and a half would be my best guess, where the question of overturning precedent is actually center stage. In the vast majority of the case, 95% of the cases, nobody's arguing about that. They're doing what they do pretty much every term, which is argue about what prior cases, either interpreting statutes or the constitution meant. Um, I don't see a huge difference in this term uh, compared to past terms in that regard. Third, observation about the court in general, and, and, and this, is, this is very abstract, but I, I just think it's very important. The court is not an it. The court is a they. The court is nine people. And some of those nine people sometimes agree with other of those nine people on some things, some of the time, to some extent. Uh, and it's very tempting to try to make sort of large judgments about how this group fits and this group fits. And, 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 and there's a non-trivial set of cases over which that makes a lot of sense. There is, there is something called the attitudinal model, which, which posits that Supreme Court justices just vote party politics and that's the end of it. And the model wouldn't have existed as long as it has if it didn't have at least some predictive and, and, and explanatory power, but very easy to, to overstate it. Just, just a couple of thoughts on that. I, I was planning to say this before it happened. Case just came down today that very sharply illustrated that Justices Kagan and Breyer have very fundamentally different views about how to interpret statutes. Uh, and that's been true uh, since both of them have been on the court. Uh, Justice Gorsuch and Justice Thomas both profess to be what we might broadly call originalists with respect to the interpretation of the Constitution. They're on the opposite side of a lot of cases. Um, I actually gave a presentation at the American Political Science Association some years ago where I just cataloged all of the major cases where Justice Gorsuch and Justice Thomas came out on, on, on different sides. And we tend to focus on a very, very small subset of the cases that the Supreme Court decides where you are likely to see the partisan divides playing out more. But, but that shouldn't obscure the fact that the vast majority of what it does 
it does pretty much the same way that it's doing it and the same way that it's done it in past years. And uh, that, that's, that's just my, my, my caution uh, not to overgeneralize from a relatively small subset of cases. Okay, let's talk about the hot button cases now. The small subset. <laughs> Yes. Um, uh, so, Melissa, that's maybe a great segue. Is it just a small subset or do we have some significance or big uh, questions before the court right now? I, I just want to note that it took us exactly 20 minutes to hit our first point of disagreement. Um, <laughs> so I have nothing but enormous respect for Gary, but I think this is actually delusional. <laughs> like, of course, there are big disagreements. Um, it is true that on issues, there are lots of issues where there's consensus and even places where you can find some surprising coalitions, um, criminal justice issues, for example, where you often see Justice Gorsuch, who has a more libertarian perspective, siding with Justice Sotomayor. That may be a very fruitful place for uh, Justice Jackson to intervene, um, to maybe perhaps find common ground with the two of them. But Yes, it is a small subset of cases on which there are partisan divides, but that small subset is the meat of our lives. Like this is questions of reproductive rights, whether New York citizens are going to be safe on the subway or whether people are going to be packing heat, um, whether affirmative action is going to be dismantled. I mean, this court has taken on a number of issues. Like the affirmative action case has been deterred till next term, but this is a jam packed term, regardless of whether you think about this term in raw numbers or in the substance of those raw numbers. Like this is an enormous term. Jed has already mentioned West Virginia versus EPA. I think that is a case that could begin the process of dismantling the administrative state. This is a project that conservatives have long been focused on, the whole idea of the constitution in exile. They had one bite at the apple in 2019, but the case happened to be a case about sex offender registries, not really the vehicle to press your conservative agenda. And so now here we are with climate change and a perfect vehicle for actually rethinking whether or not government regulation is ever appropriate. And I think they will take that opportunity. There's Jobs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, the case that is likely to overrule Roe versus Wade, as Mississippi has asked the court to do. And standing in the wings is Whole Women's Health versus Jackson, the Texas SB8 case that no one has talked about, the whole idea of the shadow docket and what the court is doing there, we haven't even talked about. So yes, it is a small subset, but wow, are they doing the most with that small subset? Um, Jed, I want to get to you in a second. I just want to ask Melissa one question, just maybe briefly describe the Texas SBA case, just because uh, I don't know how familiar our reader, uh, our viewers will be. Sure. So Texas SB 8 is a law that prohibits abortion at six weeks. And I think by most accounts, everyone understands that this is patently unconstitutional under extant jurisprudence, particularly Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which makes clear that the there is a right of a woman to terminate her pregnancy before viability in six weeks as well before the viability mark, which is usually around 23 or 24 weeks of pregnancy. Um, under the terms of this Texas statute, the state is actually prohibited from enforcing it. So the usual course of action when a statute like this is enacted by a state legislature is that it is immediately enjoined because someone sues the state actor who is in charge with enforcing it, the court steps in, says that it's unconstitutional and enjoins it and keeps it from going into effect or issues a preliminary injunction, keeps it from going into effect while its constitutionality is completely litigated through the federal system. With SB8, you don't get that mechanism going forth. You don't get the opportunity to enjoin the law and allowing it to sort of be stayed while its constitutionality is being determined because it's actually delegated to private citizens, the enforcement. So the state is not allowed to enforcement. Only private citizens can do that. And so that presents a standing problem for prospective plaintiffs because they don't actually know who to sue unless the law is in effect and someone is actually brought or a, a claim is filed against someone under the law itself. So what the law actually then does is has a chilling effect on physicians in Texas who are essentially afraid to practice and to provide abortions because they may be brought um, before the state under the terms of the statute by private individuals. So it creates this really interesting 
procedural quirk, and indeed it is that procedural quirk that the court cited in September when it refused to enjoin this law to prevent it from going into effect on September 1st of 2021. And so the law has been in effect in Texas. There have been a number of challenges. There have been some discussions from the Supreme Court, the lower federal courts, and the Texas Supreme Court about who the appropriate defendants could be, whether there are any state defendants that could be sued to perhaps enjoin this law. And it's just a tangle of litigation in a lot of ways. Um, but the fact of the matter remains is that this law has been in effect, a law that is patently unconstitutional under extant jurisprudence, has been in effect in Texas curtailing the constitutional rights of those citizens in the second most pop- one of the largest, the second largest state in the union and one of the most populous states in the union. Okay, thank you. And of course, one of the related issues um, is if this law is upheld, Um, What kind of precedent does that establish uh, for state legislatures to do similar things with respect to other rights? Well, we've Uh, already seen lots of state legislatures begin making overtures toward doing that. Idaho, I think last week, passed a similar law. California has talked about writing a similar law for the purpose of curtailing assault weapons. So the possibilities are endless. And Jed, um, do we have big stuff in front of the court right now? So I wonder if there had been a hot buttons, you know, cool conversations or WGBH back in like 1857. I think probably, you know, I wonder if if the Gary Lawson of 1857 would have said it's a really boring docket this year. I mean, there's this one case, Dred Scott. (laughs) But other than that, or or if there had been, you know, the Gary Lawson of 1954, like I don't know what else is on the Supreme Court docket in 1954. But other than Brown versus Board of Education, it's a pretty quiet year. Um, sometimes one case is so big that it that it just it changes so much about American law and American politics. Trump doesn't get elected in 2016 if Scalia doesn't die. And why is Scalia's death so pivotal? It's because the Christian evangelicals know that it was the Scalia seat that the Roe v. Wade turns on. So presidential elections are won and lost and the Republican party and the democratic party's politics, who they nominate and, and the coalitions they build turn on abortion. So it, sometimes it's quality, not quantity. And so I might say just like, it could be that this term is the kind of term that's like 1954, like 1973 when Roe was decided. And I would even go further than Melissa. I think Roe v. Wade has already been overturned. Like, I just don't think they've said it yet. But and I think I know I think Melissa might agree, but leaving SB8 in place was indicative, was a was the court already saying that this whole line of precedent is not important enough for us to pause and decide this case this year. Let's wait nine months. Uh, coincidentally, I mean, let's just wait nine months for the pause it and then we'll decide the big case. Nope, they said we're not even gonna wait the rest of the year. We're going to leave this law in place because we already know we're, we're, we know and we want to give you a little bit of a preview of of how of, of what's coming down the to, coming down the pike. But I would also note, let me just note a couple of other things about some big things that aren't on the big docket, but are on what's called. The, we've talked a little bit about the shadow docket or I also like this phrase, the lightning docket. So the shadow docket are cases that pop up that are, and we've mentioned it, but let me just be a little bit more specific, are not docketed in the regular way of putting them on the calendar in a previous year. And then there's a long wind up with a lot of litigation below that generates a record and then plenty of time for briefing and deliberation. And then a case, and then it takes months for that decision to be, to be written. The shadow docket are are more urgent cases that pop up like the vaccine mandate and like voting rights. And those cases were massive, okay? So, and this is a continuation. So we want to think about democracy. So the Voting Rights Act has, has all major parts of the Voting Rights Act were overturned a couple of years ago. But the Roberts Court with the shadow docket has made major changes to, uh, in, in one case about Alabama and one case about Miss Wisconsin that cut in opposite directions in ways that feel like a little unprecedented in a way of being inconsistent. But both raising questions about democracy and voting rights. And the vaccine mandate, now this will be, now the vaccine mandate was a huge case. I think Gary and I might agree on this one. I actually think the Roberts court got this one right, that they struck down the the vaccine mandate 
Um, that's a, and I'll say this, like, I don't want to underplay it. I think that was a huge decision and I think they got it right. Um, but, but that's, so we can dig into that, but I think that's a signal of the kind of judicial power to, to scale back on the administrative state that is, that we'll look back on that and say that vaccine mandate case was a huge case. Okay. Thank you, Jed. I, Gary, I'm, I'm going to ask you, of course, to respond to both Melissa and Jed and talk about whether or not you agree with them and other, other a big, are these cases significant for some reason? Um, at the same time, I just want to sort of throw out the, the I guess, question point slash point that if uh, Judge Jackson's confirmed, the court will be unprecedented. One thing that will be unprecedented about the court is her arrival. Um, and something to think about as we go through this discussion is what difference do you think she's going to make both in the near and far term. Um, odds look very good that she'll get confirmed. Uh, it'll be narrow vote, but it looks like it's going to happen. Um, I'm knocking on wood. Um, but um, but if you don't mind, Gary, take all that and sort of give us your, your thoughts about it. Yeah, all right. I, I do not in any way want to downplay the importance of the Dobbs case. That's, that's, a, that's a blockbuster. My point was only that I, I think that's the only one. Uh, I, I think all of these other cases uh, are, are very narrowly cast. They're likely to result in very narrow decisions one way or another. Uh, a lot of them are gonna turn on procedural niceties. They're, they're, just, they're just not, I mean, look, I, I've spent my entire academic career railing against the administrative state. I would be just, over the moon if the administrative state was blown into rubble. There, there just, there's nothing on the docket that even remotely, remotely does anything like that. It's a, it's a, it's a relatively narrow, but important, but narrow question about the interpretation of the scope of one aspect of the EPA's statutory authority. It's not, it's not a small thing. I mean, a lot of these cases are, are very important, but that's the only thing that's it, that's it. It's at stake. There's no, there's no grand constitutional question presented there. And the New York gun case doesn't, doesn't actually involve packing on the subway. It's a very, very narrow aspect of New York's permitting scheme that happens to give a lot of discretion to local officials and requires people to prove that they have some special self-defense need beyond the norm uh, before they can get a license. But all of the difficult questions about where you can carry, open carry, closed carry, subways, stadiums, th th those are not actually presented by that case. So I, I think it's extremely unlikely that, that the, the court is going to decide any of them. So I do think we have a term with one big, huge blockbuster that's going to dominate uh, uh, discussion. Um, my caution was against reading too much into, into the rest of, of, of the docket that's, that, that's going on. Um, just uh, another observation. It, once, I, yeah, I agree, Justice Jackson's going to be confirmed. Um, for those who check boxes on this sort of thing, uh, that'll be four women on the United States Supreme Court. Um, that would be unprecedented. Sure. Uh, that would have been unthinkable uh, half a century ago. I mean, just beyond science fiction stuff. Uh, uh, so anyway, that's those are those are my my uh, my my observations on 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 the the current term. And I appreciate it. Um, so, Melissa, um, I want, of course, to get your reactions and thoughts about what Gary said, but I'm also going to kind of take the liberty of mapping on. Um, uh, another issue which hasn't been mentioned yet, but one of the viewers has mentioned it, and I think it it does play into our discussion about this court being unprecedented or not. Um, there's a lot being written and said right now about Justice Clarence Thomas, and this arises because of his wife's very um, significant uh, political involvement and activities. Um, this might raise in the normal sequence of things, let's say in other contexts, possible conflicts of interest, depending upon what people knew and what the particular facts are. Um, and, and so there's, there's something else that maybe we can call somewhat unprecedented besides Judge Jackson's likely arrival. And that is the sort of the cloud that's hanging over Justice Thomas's head in terms of um, just quite frankly, a matter of ethics. And that reminds us the Supreme Court doesn't have a code of ethics. And we're gonna work that into discussion as well, 
uh, uh, as we think about not just now, but the future. But Melissa, sort of just picking up on Gary's point, just one big case, um, I suspect you have a reaction. I'm sorry, my face has no chill. So um, I think you've already <laughs> seen my reaction to Gary. Um, Gary, nothing but respect for you, but I think this is gaslighting. And um, you're right, um, Dobbs is the blockbuster case, but what a blockbuster, even if the court just did nothing more than decide Dobbs, it would be doing quite a lot to roll back 50 years worth of precedent and withdraw a right that had previously been extended. But this court is going further. And you're correct. It's not the case that West Virginia versus EPA is going to, in one fell swoop, dismantle the administrative state. But I do think it will begin the process of incrementally doing so, laying this foundation. And that has always been the hallmark of the Roberts court. It isn't one fell swoop and something is wiped off the chessboard. It's a series of incremental decisions where they build on each other in a sedimentary fashion. And they say things like, in our last case, we told you this was completely crazy and, and now we're overruling it. And so this is a standard move that they make. And I would argue that Bruin, the guns case is the same kind of thing. We are getting the progression from Heller in 2008 to McDonald versus city of Chicago, and now to Bruin where we're slowly and incrementally expanding the scope of the second amendment. First, it was just about the right of individuals to keep guns in the home untethered to any kind of malicious service for purposes of self-defense within the home. Then it was about the incorporation of that second amendment right to the states under the 14th amendment. Now it's going to be whether or not you can actually carry a concealed weapon or whether the state has the authority to limit and restrict it under certain conditions. And that is going to lead to questions about are there sensitive spaces in public life like the subway, like college campuses, like stadia, where you you cannot carry a concealed weapon. So it's not going to be one fell swoop and suddenly everyone's packing heat and it's Blade Runner, but it is going to be an incremental progression. And that has always been the point. So you're right. This isn't a wipe everything off the chessboard. It will just be wiping row off the chessboard, but that's a pretty big thing, but there's more coming. So it's a slow build, a slow burn, if you will. Um, with regard to Justice Thomas, um, yeah, this is not a great look for the court right now. We saw in September in the wake of SB8 and the court's decision to allow that to stand in Texas, the Supreme Court justices going on a kind of world tour where they were disclaiming the idea of partisanship in their institution. I think it was Justice Barrett who went to the McConnell Center at the University of Louisville to say that the court was not composed of partisan hacks. That message might have gone better if she had not been sharing the stage with with Mitch McConnell, um, but there it was. So we already know that the court is consumed with the prospect of its own legitimacy and that they have been battered and bruised over the court course of this last year. So the prospect of Ginny Thomas sending text messages to the chief of staff of the president of the United States about withholding or refusing to concede an election that has been duly conducted is a massive, massive thing. And it, whether it leads to anything regarding Mrs. Thomas, it certainly lends an aura of illegitimacy and perhaps even corruption to the court, whether that is fair or not. The whole point, though, is that the court depends on the public perceiving it as legitimate. And when there is this inextricable link between Mrs. Thomas and her politics and her husband and his work, I think it is hard for the public to view the work of the court as completely outside of the partisan fray. And so it's not a question of whether Justice Thomas can be impartial when cases involving the January 6th Select Committee or anything involving the Trump administration comes before him. It's the fact that the public may already perceive him as being not as being partial in some way. I, I'm no expert on judicial ethics, so I don't want to, to make any proclamations on the subject. It is so far outside of my field. But I, mean, I, I just wonder to what extent would any public official in any capacity, judicial or otherwise, uh, be responsible for what their family members say or do? I mean, if, 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 uh, if, if a justice's spouse wants to contribute time or money to Planned Parenthood, I'd I can't imagine how that would mean the justice would have to recuse themselves from a case like Dobbs. That that does not make any sense to me. But again, that is not a subject that I have any expertise in. Uh, and if people say I'm full of it, they're they're probably right. <laughs>
I mean, mm-hmm. there, there's the whole example of Abe Fortas back in the 1950s and his wife, Carolyn Eggers, and like the appearance of impropriety related to her own practice as a lawyer. So, so there's that. And that did lead to Abe Fortas's resignation, which in turn, I think, really shaped the composition of the court in ways that we are feel real, feeling the repercussions of today. But I'm not suggesting that um, it is impossible for a Supreme Court justice's spouse to have a separate life that is rich and complicated and you know with their own interests. But it is a question of optics. The Supreme Court is not bound by any particular rules of ethics, although there is a federal statute that prevents judges, any judge, whether it's the Supreme Court justices or the lower federal court just judges, um, from hearing a case in which a family member has a stake in the interest. And a case involving the January 6th Select Committee, where there's the possibility that Mrs. Thomas's text might be surfaced as part of the disclosure, would seem to be relatively close to the terms of that statute. And so, again, I think the real question here is the optics and the public perception, and the optics here are quite poor. Thank you. Jed, I know you wanted to make a point. Uh, well, I, um, I did write a book about judicial ethics. Um, so, so it's called The People's Courts. It's more of a history. Um, and it's, and on the one, uh, one thing about America is we have to be much more open to uh, j- judges being involved with politics, because as Michael, you wrote uh, books and articles about this, right? The courts have always been political, right? There's a myth that courts are now political. They've been political from the get-go, right? From the 1790s, 1800s, uh, John Marshall from the beginning, right? Um, and nevertheless, and, and, and I wrote a book about state judicial elections, that we have partisan elections where it's not wives and husbands of judges, it's the judges going and raising millions of dollars from parties that have cases before them in the docket. So so we've, and so what, I, the problem is that this entire federal and state system that is so political is its own form of gaslighting about uh, how much we should accept. The doctrine of recusal, is 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 it's problematic it's in its enforcement because it's only about self enforcement but there's still doctrine and there's still a norm and that doctrine is that judges must avoid the appearance of partiality and they have a duty to maintain a, a uh, maintain the appearance of justice and i think that's clearly i mean i i think there's a consensus among judicial ethics scholars um, and professional responsibility scholars that Clarence Thomas should have recused from the cases that are directly, not from Dobbs, but should never have voted. And, it, and there's also a bit of conspiratorial thinking that Thomas voted, it was the lone dissent in the case about this investigation. I mean, obviously, if he knew he was the lone dissent, it would be a very bad way to cover it up, to be the only dissenter on the losing side. So there, it's not a conspiracy. It's just, I think we've gotten to a point where um, there's a sense of no accountability. Um, so. Yeah. And, and or another way to think about it. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right, Jed. I, it's, it's a question of accountability. You know, how, if at all, do the justices get held accountable, um, particularly on matters, many of which never see the light of day? Um, sometimes we don't discover stuff until years after they're gone. Um, but, Gary, um, I'm going to come back to you. Um, uh, not If you want to address the ethics points, that's fine. Otherwise, maybe think about the future and the court. All right. The, here are my observations on the future. Okay. okay. It, if I was actually any good at predicting the future of the Supreme Court, I would not be a law professor. I would be marketing that remarkable talent on eBay and auctioning it off to the highest bidder. Uh, and I would be living a much different life than I'm living right now. So anything that I say, about what the future is likely to bring has to be seen in that light. Uh, uh, why, why, why would anybody think? All right, with, with, with that said, I mean, Melissa, Melissa is, 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 is certainly right up to a point. I mean, we are, we are talking about incremental movements across any number of, of legal developments. Uh, that's absolutely true. This is why people go crazy about Supreme Court appointments because, 
you know, every once in a while, you're going to have a Dobbs where it's a, a huge sea change potentially, but even where you don't, yeah, it, it, it makes a difference uh, uh, incrementally across a range of questions. I, I think it's a much more complex set of differences uh, than one thinks. Uh, 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 Melissa has pointed out one area that, that I think is under-examined, and that is uh, criminal procedure. Uh, the, the, in the 1970s, Richard Nixon had a very single-minded philosophy about appointing judges. He was going to try to appoint judges who would lock up guilty crooks. That was, that was the whole point. You want to you put the guilty crooks in, in, in prison and succeeded to some extent. And, and you wound up with what I think all three of us would agree is some really bizarre law. Uh, developed uh, during that time uh, that just makes no sense when you actually look at the relevant constitutional provisions. And the incremental movements that you've seen over the last, I would say, two decades um, have, uh, have, have not had an obvious political valence. Uh, some of this, some of that, and the other. Uh, but now there's, there's no doubt that, that, it, that it makes a difference. Uh, who, who the court, I'm not saying otherwise. Uh, I am just saying that those are incremental. Those are, those are relatively small moves. And, and five years from now or 10 years from now or 15 years from now, when, when you get to the next sort of marginal point where it's going to make a significant difference, it's it going to be the same group of nine people that it is now. Uh, are, are they going to have the same levels of agreement and disagreement across various things uh, as it is now? I'm not sure about that. Uh, I, I, I don't know uh, what, what the world's going to look like 10 or 15 years from now. I, I have enough trouble explaining my students what it looks like now without trying to predict uh, what, these, uh, what these nine people are, are uh, whoever the next nine people are 10 years from now are, are, are likely to do. I have to try. I mean, I teach administrative law. Uh, I have to try to guess for my students Okay, this is how federal courts generally review legal interpretations of agencies. It's how they've done it for the last 30 years or so. Five years from now, when you're out practicing, are they going to be doing that the same way? You know, talk to me next year and then maybe I'll have some, some, some more to say. I can tell you what the snapshot of the world looks like right now. And you kind of need to know that if you're going to be a lawyer. But five years from now, would that snapshot look, look differently? It, it, it might. I mean, there are definitely there are movements like that uh, that you can see in, in, in the current cases. Uh, let me just say, well, I'm taking a lot of time. Let me just say one more thing and then I'll shut up. Uh, th there is a potential significance to this, to this West Virginia case. It's, it would take a long time to explain exactly what the issues are there. It has to do with whether the Environmental Protection Agency and applying the Clean Air Act. Everyone agrees that it can mandate specific cleaning technologies for particular plants. The question is whether it also has the authority under the statute to make large policy decisions that essentially shift large forms of generation of power from one mode to another. It's, a, it's, a, it's not, a, not a small question, it's a very large question. Uh, how, how is the court going to address that? Well, for the last 30 plus years, uh, interpretations of statutes by federal agencies have over a large range come into court with a what you might call a presumption of correctness. The, the courts are only going to overturn those interpretations if they're not just wrong, but, but in some sense, seriously wrong. Over the last decade, well, actually, I would say going back two decades, going back to about 2000, uh, there's been some pushback against that. And, and by the way, the, when, that, when that doctrine was first introduced, the partisan valence was liberals or progressives thought it was a terrible idea. Because of course, Ronald Reagan was the president. So that meant giving deference to, 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 to Reaganite agencies. And the, the, the valence of the opposition or support for this doctrine has shifted unsurprisingly over time, depending upon who's president at the moment and what they thought their electoral prospects were. It's a, it's a, it's a complicated story. But anyway, the, the, there's been some pushback against that. Uh, and and that, that has some non-trivial effect on the way that, that federal administrative agencies can, can carry out their missions. And the one thing I will say about the, the, the Virginia case, it, it, it does potentially signal a change in this respect. Courts have carved out over two decades, 
a certain set of statutory questions that are considered to be really important big ones. And if it's a really important big question, well, maybe that's not the kind of question that Congress thought agencies should get a presumption on. Maybe courts should just figure out what the right answer is. And there, there, there's been some back and forth on that, but there's some doctrine about that. But the bigness or significance of the question has only been used up till now as a reason not to give a lot of weight to what the agency said. The way this particular case is being argued, people are using the bigness of the agents of the, of the issue as a reason to interpret the statute from first principles one way rather than another. Uh, that's a, that's, that would be a significant, that's something I would have to teach my administrative law students, oh, we're now doing it differently now. So if, if, if the Supreme Court does that, if they buy into this notion that, well, because it's a really important question, that's a reason to interpret the statute against the agency, as opposed to a reason not to interpret it in favor of the agency, it's a very big difference there. Yeah, then I will, I will add that to the list of, of, of major cases. That would be a really big deal. I don't know that they're going to do that, but that would be, that would be a big deal. All right. End of, end of administrative law junkies. Uh, 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 tyrant. Yeah. Yes, as Judge Bork said, it was like eating sawdust with butter. Um, I'm not sure when he tried to eat sawdust with butter, but, um, but in any event, um, uh, I appreciate your walking us through that. Um, just one other sort of comment from me before I ask Melissa and all of you the last round of questioning. Um, when we go back and look at um, the Supreme Court's overruling of its own precedents, the most common way the Supreme Court uh, overrules its precedents, the most popular way for the court to overrule its precedents is based on their inconsist inconsistency with prior precedents. Not whether they're wrong, not any other factor. And this is why the incremental decision-making matters because it, it, it is uh, establishing a line of cases which may well be dismantling the foundation for a precedent. And the, uh, we saw that arguably even in uh, the series of cases that led up to Brown and eventually led to the um, dismantlement and obviously overruling of Plessy versus Ferguson, the separate but equal doctrine. We may be seeing it. Um, it's already been happening with regard to Roe versus Wade. Um, and so maybe this is a good spot with about eight minutes left to ask each of you, what do you foresee for the future and the Supreme Court? You can take that any direction you like. Um, and I'll start with Melissa. So it's, it's a really good point, Michael. Um, I, I might say something slightly different about the pre-Brown cases, which is to say that I think the strategy that the NAACP Legal Defense Fund was using and that the court sort of hopped onto was the idea that, in fact, separate was not equal, that there were massive differences in the material conditions of segregated facilities that made the promise of separate but equal a false one. And Brown, I read, is slightly different from Sweat versus Painter or Missouri X. Rel versus Gaines, those earlier cases, because Brown is about the changed conditions of public education. I, in the Plessy period, you could think about public education um, as not being something the state did, but in 1954, it is something that is clearly within the purview of the state. And as the Brown court says, it is the very foundation of good citizenship. Therefore, perhaps the prospect of separate but equal in public education really misses the mark. Um, and so I, I might view it as slightly different, um, but you were exactly right. And I think the logic holds for things like the public union cases that the Roberts courts dismantled over the course of a series of different precedents culminating in Janice a few years ago. Um, what does that mean for Roe? I actually think with Roe, it cannot be an incremental decision that just, it's not that Roe is inconsistent with earlier precedents. And Justice Thomas, I think, is the one who's drawn that line in the stand. Roe is wrong and must be overruled because it is a constitutional apostasy in his view. And I don't think they will brook any equivocation on that. It's, you know, there's been some discussion of maybe the facts have changed about viability. Um, perhaps now it's different for women and you can leave your baby at a, a fire station and still go on and, and have a career. But I think at bottom for the really rock rib conservatives on that court, and I think there are a number of them, the only plausible reason for overruling Roe and, and the only reason that makes sense to that view, that worldview, is that 
it is wrong. It is unmoored from constitutional text and unmoored from morality. Thank you. Jed, in terms of the future. So let me, I'm going to give you some like a bullet list of some predictions. I'm going to go the opposite of Gary, but in some ways I'm going to agree with Gary, uh, both about the predictions and about what, how, how progressives might welcome our new uh, libertarian overlords. <laughs> if, <they're, laughs> if, if you can imagine a libertarian overlord, but let me give you some, let me give you some bullet points about what, what shadow docket cases have been decided and how they are, or, or big cases are decided and what they might portend of the future. One, the voting rights cases have a more formalistic approach to whether people can take, a, take consideration of race and voting rights. That is a preview of ne next term's docket on affirmative action. If you take those writing, voting rights cases as, as, as predictive, affirmative action is going to be much is going to be swept away in a much more robust way by the next court. Um, if Roe v. Wade gets overturned, it, it isn't just about reproductive rights in other ways. It's also about marriage equality. If Roe v. Wade gets overturned, the, the doctrinal basis for Roe v. Wade is substantive due process. The basis for marriage equality is not equal protection. It is substantive process. And also, you know, Justice Kennedy's hallmark card of a decision. I mean, it's not a good decision. <laughs> it's not a very, I would rather have an equal protection decision for marriage equality, but Kennedy, you, know, you, you live and die with substantive due process, marriage equality. I would not be shocked if, the, if Roberts was in dissent, but there was a 5-4 decision overturning Obergefell, the case that guaranteed marriage equality. And then now let me shift a little bit, because I think, Gary, I think the Supreme Court has already said, well, if the Supreme Court invokes this, these doctrines you said, that would be a big deal. Gary, I, they did it. I mean, the vaccine mandate, they over the, and look, I actually think the Roberts Court got it right in overturning the vaccine mandate. But when the Supreme Court overturned the vaccine mandate, they were being very non-deferential uh, to administrative power, to executive power. And, uh, and to um, flexible interpretation statutes. But the reason why I'm gonna suggest that progressives might welcome these libertarian overlords is that after four years of Trump, I think one of the, and, and after looking around at the world at, at Orban and in Poland and Turkey and Putin, I think one of the greatest dangers in the 21st century is authoritarianism, presidential, authoritarian, uh, presidential authoritarianism and administrative authoritarianism. And if the cost is that the Biden get, can't get a vaccine mandate through by short circuiting process, I think that's also how I would want courts to block the Muslim ban and stop kids from being put in cages and to protect dreamer, right? That, I, I think there are lots of ways that the biggest dangers in the 21st century are the next, as the next populist authoritarian president. And maybe one rationalization to make with, the, with this libertarian turn is that it, 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 it might take away some good policy, but the biggest dangers might also be reduced as well. Uh, Gary, of course, I'll come to that final question um, for you about the future. We've also gotten a question from the audience, which you can just simply work into your answer. It's pretty closely connected to what we're talking about. If Roe is overturned by the court, could the court overturn, could that be overturned later by another Supreme Court with different justices? Of course, I think we know the answer. There have been such arguable flip-flops in a number of different areas of constitutional law, including the Commerce Clause. But I will um, let you talk about the future. Yeah, no, that is that is the short answer. There, there have been instances where exactly that has happened, where you go one way and then it gets overturned and then it gets overturned again. That's it, It's not a commonplace thing, but it's not an unheard of thing as well. Uh, so yeah, the short answer to that one is 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 of course. Um, I mean, I, I agree with Melissa. I think this this particular case is is up or down. I mean, you either there, there, there's, there's not a lot of ways incrementally to play around uh, with with the case that the court has. Uh, they're they're going to have to they're going to have to go up. They're going to go have to go down. Uh, Thirty years ago, by the way, we had exactly the same conversations uh, about a case uh, called Casey versus Planned Parenthood, uh, and the assumption at the time was it's going down, and it didn't. They instead uh, 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 reaffirmed it. Um, I'll go on record saying I don't think that's going to happen this time. Uh, we'll see if I'm if I'm if I'm right or wrong, but that's that's my best guess. 
Uh, but is it in, in, in general, is, is the attitude of this court towards precedent materially different from what you've seen uh, in, in, in past times? I think that's a hard proposition to maintain. If you look at the court of say the 1960s, was it more uh, less inclined to, to, to break new ground or overturn decisions than the, than the court of today? I, I, that's a, I don't know how you measure those things, but just anecdotally, I think it's a very hard proposition uh, to, to maintain. Now, I'm personally one of the small number of academics who's generally skeptical of the whole idea of, of precedent. I think courts should be getting the right answer, not figuring out what other people have said. Um, that, that's, that's not the way that they do it. Uh, it's, it's maybe the way Clarence Thomas would do it. It's, it's not the way anybody else would do it. It's certainly not the way Neil Gorsuch would do it. Um, so uh, the, the interesting question to me is, 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 is the one that Jed raised. And that is if, if the court overrules, uh, Roe and Casey and the whole line of, of abortion cases are, are they doing it? just because they happen to be abortion cases or are they doing it because they have rejected root and branch the entire conception of substantive due process? Um, if, if the latter is what happens, we're going to have a very interesting conversation next year. And I would be very, very eager to be part of that conversation next year because that's going to be a fun one. Uh, maybe that's logically inevitable. Um, Logic inevitable, logical inevitability has never been a hallmark of decisions of the Supreme Court in any of its capacities. So I, I, I think that's an interesting theoretical possibility. I'll believe that when I see it. I just, I don't think that's, that's, that's what they're up to. Thank can you, Gary. Yeah. Michael, can yeah. I say something sure. about that? Um, yeah. Just to link it back to Judge Jackson's confirmation, um, we heard a lot about unenumerated rights last week at the confirmation hearings, which was unusual because that actually was, I think, our first post-row confirmation hearing. And usually when we talk about unenumerated rights in the context of the confirmation, abortion is the elephant in the room. And so, you know, I, I think Jed is right. Um, the repeated references to unenumerated rights were about what comes after Roe. And we heard Marsha Blackburn talking about Griswold versus Connecticut and the right to contraception. We heard John Cornyn talking about Obergefell versus Hodges and same-sex marriage. So I think that is where the fight is going. Right. I do think that Gary is correct that you know there is so much support for same-sex marriage, for example, that overruling it in you know three years, five years is, is very unlikely. But what I think is more likely, and we also saw shades of this in the confirmation, is the appeal to quote unquote text-based rights like religious liberty and the accommodation of religious objections to same-sex marriage. And if those get expanded over the course of some 20 years, we've actually made it harder for same-sex couples to occupy space in the public sphere. And once you make it harder and you normalize the prospect of limiting space for same-sex couples, What's to say in 30 or 40 years, we're not back in the same post row moment and you then can overrule Obergefell. So I wouldn't put Obergefell on the back burner yet, though I do agree with Gary that its demise is not imminent. There's still a tremendous amount we could talk about um, and, and I still want to be thinking about the future. Um, and let's try and link up what we've been saying about the court doctrinally with the court as an institution. Let's go back, let's let's dare Gary to think of it as an it just for a moment. Um, and what I'm wondering about uh, comes up from, uh, is a question from the audience about um, why are we not considering term limits for Supreme Court justices? But I wanna ask, not just about that, but the same thing in a different way, which is if you were reforming the court at all, what would be your preference? What would be your proposal or, or uh, suggestion? And I'll, I'll start with Gary and then Jed and Melissa, okay? I, I actually don't think term limits would be a terrible idea. I mean, my, my good friend and oft co-author, Steve Calabresi has come up with a proposal that makes a great deal of sense to me. Uh, that would essentially, you didn't need a constitutional amendment to do it. You couldn't do it without a constitutional amendment, but um, 18 years and every two years a justice comes up. So you don't have situations where one presidential term completely transforms a court. It would have to be done gradually over time. Uh, I, I, that, that makes a, a great deal of sense along a, a number of dimensions. 
Uh, one of which is, you know, people live longer than they did in 1789. Uh, so, you know, tenure during good behavior means, generally speaking, something different uh, than it might have meant uh, in 1789. So something that accommodates that uh, is, is, I don't know how much difference it would make. Uh, it might reduce the, the heat uh, of, of individual confirmations, whether it's in the end going to lead to better or worse decisions. That's, I think that's, I think, much less clear. But uh, as a first cut, that's, that's not, a, that's not a, a, something that should be on the table, something that's worth discussing. Absolutely. Thank you. Jed? Well, here's where I'll disagree with Gary. For, I think term limits at best are irrelevant for the current moment. So they, I mean, the only way that you could have term limits is to be prospective so that anyone on the court now you would ha has to be on, on the court for life. You can't, I mean, if, if, if you amended the constitution, maybe you could change it. I totally agree with Gary that it's a non-starter to do it by statute. And if you need to do it by amendment, it's never gonna happen, right? So um, I just think it's a, it's a non-starter, but I also think it's probably on balance it's either neutral or it's a bad idea. And here's why it's a bad idea. We have seen justices with life tenure already seeing themselves as celebrities. So, and I think this is true on the left and the right. It's like, you know, Justice Breyer, just, you know, Breyer and, and Scalia doing their little dog and pony show. And then, you know, like, oh, we're such good friends and we're gonna sell books. Um, and if you had them retire, if they hadn't, if, if you not, you're still going to, we're not going to unwind. There's no going back to nominating 50 year olds, but instead of having a job for 40 years where they can just do their thing and have judicial independence. Now it's, I've got a clock. And when I retire, I've been a public servant for my entire life. And I'd actually like to have a job it, when I, when I retire, when I'm forced to retire at 68. Um, I'd actually love to have a gig on Fox News or MSNBC and sell a lot more books. And I think it would I think it would be really bad to know that not either justices were conscious of this or to have the appearance of playing even more than they do to their base. I think the left, I think the justices on the left and the right are both guilty of this, of, of, of writing in a style that is too bombastic and too, you know, and so I, I think it's actually a really bad idea. Um, I, what I'd rather see is, uh, is court packing, <laughs> but a certain kind of court packing that is responsive to Gary's concern. Every two years, a, a president should be able to nominate and add someone to the court. And so you get with, with one set of Senate elections, you get one president and one Senate, and they, we would have a, like a 2022 edition, and then you'd have a 2020, you know, early 2024, and then you just keep adding judges to the court. And there's another reason why this is a good thing. Nine is too few, right? Nine, I, I think we, we have a much more complicated world in terms of we need more experts on science and history and textualism. And how about some economists who actually know something about tax, taxation, right? So if we had more justices, we could have a more expert court for a more complicated world. So let's, let's go up to, so let's go to a court of 19 or, or 21 or 23. Uh, and, and, and it would still be spaced out responsive to Gary's concern about an FD, a, a Roosevelt or a Biden adding six. I do think that's a bad idea, but let's, let's let each election put, let's put a, let's put a seat on the court on the ballot in every single presidential and midterm election. Um, Melissa, I expect you have, a some thoughts about that. I, I confess I'm, I find myself a little bit skeptical in part because, um, I don't buy into the myth of the Supreme Court very much. You know, given your point and agreement, Jed, that the court's political, um, then I just think we make it more intensely political. Um, and I'm not sure that's uh, ultimately a good thing. Um, one of the things I, I just would also point out is, you know, Mark Graber at the University of Maryland had this great thought experiment. And Mark said, think of the 50 most significant policy developments or events over the last 50 years. And of course, the court's not going to be in that list. But you can think of things like clean air, clean water, Civil Rights Act. Um, you can think of things like Americans with Disabilities Act and so on. So the, the more we focus on the court and keep focusing on the court, the less I, I, I think we focus on institutions that still do make a constitutional difference, um, beginning with Congress. But that's just my two cents. 
But Melissa? No, I, I don't disagree with you. Um, I, I remember when Mark posed that thought experiment, and, and, and you're right, like the court is not among the most significant policy de developments of the last 50 years. Um, but I, I will say that the court has managed to retard many of the most significant <laughs> policy developments of the last 50 years. And I think therein is the rub. I mean, this goes to Jed's point. And I, I actually don't have firm views about court packing. Um, you know, I, I and generally I, I hear all of the arguments about sort of escalating the politicization of the court. And, you know, I, I think Jed offers a reasonable solution. I agree with Gary that term limits are a wise move. I don't necessarily think they require a constitutional amendment if you rotate your Supreme Court justices to other federal judiciary positions and they continue to have like tenure just somewhere else. Like perhaps that is a way to avoid the need for a constitutional amendment. Um, but I did just want to end on, you know, the escalating politicization that happens in other branches and how it impacts the court, I think, is worth thinking about. And, you know, I was one of those progressive slash liberals who was very agitated when a Republican Senate would not seat the Obama judges, like really wouldn't give them hearings, wouldn't like let them go through. And you know, there were a lot of people calling for the nuclear option, ending the filibuster on federal judges that happened. And then when the Trump administration came in, um, they ended the federal the filibuster for Supreme Court justices. And I think that's really been problematic because what it has done is basically allowed both parties to put forth the most extreme aspects of their ideologies onto the bench. And at least with the requirement of the filibuster, and I can't believe I'm sitting here defending the filibuster, but here we are. Um, at least with the filibuster, you had to try and get bipartisan support, which meant that you had to moderate some of those impulses and, and you got a more moderate nominee. Now, that is to say a lot of people were left out. You did not have public defenders. You didn't have labor lawyers, but you also didn't have ideologues. And, you know, maybe there's something about going back to that. And, you know, perhaps some of those fixes within the other institutions are worth thinking about. Maybe jurisdiction stripping is another thing that we might think about. Um, Rick Hasen has talked about, Rick Hasen rather has talked about that in re with regard to voting rights legislation. All of this should be on the table because as this program notes, this is an unprecedented court. Let me suggest one more reform that could be done with a statute abolish law clerks. <laughs> I'm quite serious about that, by the way. Yeah, I, uh, the I, pernicious yeah. institution, make the justices do their own work, and maybe they won't stay on for 35 years. <laughs> quite serious if they have to do their own work. It's a terrific point, yeah. Um, Marshall is, is, John Marshall, of course, is uh, can oftentimes be a counterexample of a number of different things. Incidentally, still the longest serving Chief Justice of the United States up until now, um, though he died in the 1830s. So that, um, Gary, that cuts a little bit against your, your point. Um, and of course, Marshall was chief justice long after the death of the political party uh, of the president who appointed him. Um, but moving, but something else about John Marshall sort of also sort of occurred to me as we were talking about this, and that has to do with going back to a basic question. Let's go let's think about whether or not it's possible. I want to pick up on Gary's point that somehow there's this, there are lines of cases out there that don't turn on, let's say, ideology. Um, my question now coming back around is, is that, is that really true? Let's think about areas like statutory construction, which is a very big hotbed right now um, of um, focus for the Supreme Court. Um, even all those cases, administrative law and everything else, they all involve all sorts of things that depend on who's the justice. Not, um, you wouldn't trade, you know, a Kagan and um, a Scalia, let's say, um, in, in some of these, uh, in many of these situations. Is it, is, it, is it the best way to think of the court as simply being, let's say, somewhat shaped by politics and only the big cases? Or is, it, is there something more, um, uh, sizable and pervasive than that. Um, Jed? Something more than politics that shapes the court is, uh, yeah. Or, well, so yeah, I, it's a great, I, so I'm, I teach a class called legislation and regulation to one else. And, and I have been grappling with 
how much the law really shapes the decisions or is it shapes the way the decisions come out. Right. And so, so there are a lot, I could, Michael, I could talk about this for a while, but let me just highlight. Oh, we got all night. Keep going. <laughs> in this, so, so I think that Katanji Brown Jackson, Judge Jackson had re reflects a, uh, gave a really good set of answers that I thought were sincerely textualist and contextualist and also not such not so focused on the importance of precedent. And I think in ways that I think I think Gary, you might you might have a judge you like, right? There like she gave answers that Gary should like. Now I I think that's partly because we live in an era where you know Justice Kagan says we're all textualists now. And it's 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 true. Like what is textualism? Textualism is reading the words in a statute uh, that Congress passed without it being updated, without looking at legislative history. Now I'm not, I'm, I'm more of a progressive originalist rather than a textualist. But I think there, you can either see out of a, um, there is a commitment to methodology, which, is, which can be, and I hope is a constraint on this court. I hope, so Gorsuch writes a decision in favor of LGBT people being covered by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And I don't think it was just a political gambit. Uh, I think it was a sincere commitment to methodology. Now that's on the one hand, I think that's the good news. I think the bad, and I think what I'm hopeful for is that originalism will also be a limit on a very conservative and somewhat ideological court, not just voting their partisan ideology, but being constrained by the original constitution. So let me close on this, right? I wanna make a pitch for progressive originalism. Because compared to the Trump era, I would rather be governed by the median framer in their values or the median radical Republican who ratified the 14th Amendment and ratified racial progress rather than the median Trump ideologue any day. Now, the question is, how faithful will they be to the purposes and vision of 1787? and the purposes and the vision of, of, of Reconstruction in 1868. So if I'm being hopeful and maybe being naive, I hope originalism will be a, and textualism will be a methodological limit on a more, on an unprecedentedly ideological court. Um, thanks, Jed. I mean, I, of course, one question that occurs to me is whether the text and the original meaning at some point run out, you know, they, do they, um, is there a point at which neither really can be helpful in finding the answer because neither is clear or definable? In any event, um, uh, Melissa, as we think now about our future as a panel and about to sort of be, uh, wrap ourselves up, um, I'll give you a chance to sort of respond to Chad and Gary and otherwise just share some final thoughts about uh, the court. So yeah, I agree with Jed that um, we typically think about these schools of interpretation, originalism and textualism and sort of associate them with particular ideological perspectives. And, and we ought not do that, that there is nothing inherently conservative about originalism, nor is there anything inherently conservative about textualism. And, and we saw that in Bostock. Um, that said, there are still humans who are administering these formulas. And, you know, I will note that it is true that Justice Gorsuch, um, a, a faithful textualist by his own admission, came to the conclusion that the because of sex portion or based on sex portion of Title VII included discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity um, because he was being faithful to the text. But then a few pages later, he also made clear that there were robust text-based protections for religious liberty that might be limits on the force of Title VII to provide anti-discrimination protections to those very constituencies. So I don't know that progressive textualism alone will save us from an emboldened conservative block that views the First Amendment and religious liberty um, in, in very expansive ways and, and perhaps in ways that um, embiggen particular religious groups um, above more minority religions, religions that are not necessarily well represented in the American populace. And, and that is something that I, I do think about, like the differences 
um, in the treatment of Muslim prisoners or Buddhist prisoners, for example, versus Christian conservatives, um, which has been quite marked during the course of this court's tenure. So I agree with everything that Jed has said. Um, I, I think I'm far more pessimistic about what lies ahead um, than either Jed or Gary. Definitely more pessimistic than Gary. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Gary, um, I obviously will turn it to you for some final thoughts, but let me also preface it with a question, which is, um, do you, um, assuming you're right, that there is only really a small subset of cases that turn a great deal on ideology or ideological commitments, what's the other thing? What's the other methodology that um, the justices are deploying? It doesn't look to me like the classic things we all probably learned back in law school when it came to statutory construction and legal reasoning. So what is it then? What's that methodology? And what's the, what, what are the justices doing if it's not politics? Well, it, it, there are nine of them that are doing different things. And over a set of, a range of things, those happen to create, well, I guess the buzz phrase is an overlapping consensus that yields results in certain cases. Uh, it, it is not the case that all of the justices on, from either party are uniformly selected because of their commitment to a particular decisional methodology. I mean, Jed is onto something really, really important here, which is that, that methodology is not the same thing as politics. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. They're, 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 they're quite distinct. Um, to the extent that people are selected based on their methodologies, then one, one would assume that that's, that's what they're going to do. Justice Gorsuch would be a really good example of this. Um, it, do Justices Roberts or Kavanaugh or Barrett have the same sort of methodological commitments as a Justice Gorsuch? The answer is clearly no. They, 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 they obviously don't. Uh, so what are they making, basing their decisions on? Well, like most people who've been on the Supreme Court over the course of more than two centuries, uh, it's an eclectic mix of this, that, and the other thing, a little of column A, a little of column B, and you mush it all together, and, uh, and the world muddles through. There have been very few people who have been put on the Supreme Court who have a consistently applied methodology of anything. Justice Breyer had a very consistently applied methodology, and if he had been on the court 40 years ago, he would have been on the, in the majority of virtually every case uh, that he sat on. Um, in 2022, he's an eight to one dissenter uh, in a case that just came out today, using a methodology for interpreting statutes that would have been clearly the consensus view 40 years ago, but 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 has shifted. Um, so there are a few that, that that have these kinds of methodological commitments. I mean, my own personal preference is I would like to see people appointed because of their methodological commitments, not because of their politics or how people think they're likely to vote in, in hot button cases. Uh, I don't get that very often. Uh, I get that very, very rarely. Um, but you know, the, 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 short, the, the short answer to your question as opposed to the long answer is it's a, to, 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 to mix like it's always been. Uh, for, for the entire history. It's very hard to pin people down as this is this is what they do. They, they kind of do this and they kind of do that. And in this case, they do this. And in this case, they do that. That's, that's, that's the way it's always been. Well, one thing, of course, I haven't heard that we haven't said that at least three of the current justices all said at the time of their nominations, um, Justice uh, uh, Gorsuch and Justice Barrett particularly, just Kavanaugh less so, all said that they would uh, use Justice Scalia as their model and that they were in the mold of Justice Scalia. But it doesn't sound like they're necessarily using his methodology to the extent we can say he had a systematic methodology. He certainly thought he did. Now, whether or not it worked like he thought or we could critique it, of course, um, there will be debate. Um, but uh, but in talking about the future of the court, nobody said, well, we can see these justices follow what Scalia would have done. Um, are they, in fact, not following Scalia, but modifications, adaptions of, of Justice Scalia, Jed, or to what extent are they 
Um, yeah, Michael, I'm going to disagree. I mean, fine. more than any, I, I think Scalia now has sealed his role of probably being with the Mount Rushmore of justices ever. I mean, some people think that's great. Some people don't. But he has, when Justice Kagan said, we're all textualists now, it's because Scalia took the legacy of the Warren court and right. just ground like with the force of methodology and clarity and and a mix of democratic theory uh and politics we're we're all in the shadow of justice scalia uh and and so scalia uh, scalia wrote this really nice essay it's like 45 pages and i think most people if you're willing to sit through the three the four of us talking for an hour and a half you would actually, I think you would be edified and you would find color, you'd find really compelling um, Scalia's essay in a matter of interpretation. Now that, I call that Scalia 1.0 or, or psych, there was Scalia 1.0 who, who I think gave a really clear methodological explanation for how textualism and originalism are more, more, dem, more consistent with democratic theory. I'll, I'll have less to say. I'll stop before I talk about uh, Scalia 2.0. Uh, but but uh, but I think that we're all in that. We're all. I think that textualism and originalism is the starting point um, of the debate, and anything else is an add-on at this point until there is a, the next Earl Warren or the next uh, Frank, uh, the next uh, Holmes or Cardozo, who gives us a different paradigm. Jed, I, I uh, thank you. And I want to thank all of you very much. Um, Melissa, as you said, you were concluding as a pessimist. My wife always worries that every time I conclude that I'm leave, that I'm pessimistic. So let me let me flip the script and say that there's nothing to be pessimistic about with the opportunity to talk with all of you. Uh, it's a terrific opportunity. I'm sure everybody learned a great deal. There is a ton to talk about more. Um, hopefully we'll have that chance someday. But I'm really honored to have a chance to visit with all of you and uh, speak with all of you tonight. And I'll turn it back over to Mark. Um, about 45 minutes ago, I got a text from uh, uh, Fiona Epstein. I'm going to embarrass her if she's still on. Fiona was the staff person who was around, was was a big part of the, uh, of the, she was the doula, the big part of the birthing of the John Simon Hot Button School Conversations uh, series and she texted me and said, "Can you imagine John Seaman listening?" And I, I had that same thought exactly as Fiona said it is John Seaman of blessed memory for who the series is named. I said to Fiona in, in, in responding to her text, "This is what we envisioned. This is what we imagined." And and Gary, thank you for the the praise for the JCC uh, or JCC Greater Boston taking this on. But this is this is what we imagined this this could be. And I would suggest that the answer to the question of why is because not as a JCC, but as a Jewish people, for the last 2000 years, we've been taking documents and rulings and laws and discussing them and agreeing on them and disagreeing on them and civilly, so with such civility talking about them in our disagreements that we even decided to write it down and we called it this book, the Talmud, and it's what we study because we believe it's a key to survival. Capturing civil conversation, agreement and disagreement is core to who we are and to our survival. No group of panelists and moderator have done that in the 30 years that we've been having this series as, as well as you, you all did tonight. So Jed and Melissa and Gary, extraordinary agreement. I loved it when you agreed and disagreed and disagreed, got excited when Gary agreed with Melissa and Melissa said, I agree with Gary and got just as excited when you disagreed. And, and Michael, a masterful job of moderating the panel tonight from, from our hearts, really, uh, I, I have to say that. I want to also a, a shout out to the brilliant Amy Eisner, who is the staff person for the uh, John Hammond Hot Button School Conversation Series, for being the architect of this panel and the curator of putting together the wonderful minds in conversation uh, that you so uh, all so eloquently and articulately shared with us this evening. And uh, yes, to be continued, and uh, we we promise you not only a, a free membership to the JCC uh, <laughs> on, on your next visit to the neighborhood, uh, but an invitation back to uh, to the Hot Buttons, uh, cool John Salmon Hot Buttons Cool Conversations uh, series. So thank you all, and to our audience and participants, and our great friends at WGBH for the wonderful job they always do. Thank you all, and have a have a good night. <laughs>